anybody. I'm good? All right, that's better. Let's open up in prayer this morning. Lord God, we love you, God. We're here to lift your voice, to lift your name, to hear your voice, Lord God. We praise you. We thank you. We love you, Lord. You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You're the answer. You're the way. You're the truth. We exalt you, God, in this place. And we ask you to let your spirit fall on this people. We ask you to move in our hearts. We ask you to let us hear you today.
of good. Lift your voices and just declare how good he is. Shake this place. You
you to run into his arms this morning. He has all we need. another round. Let's give a big celebration, Jesus. Hello? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Lord Jesus, praise us. We continue. Have your absolute way. In Jesus' name. If you would please pray with me. Before we pray, I just want to ask you to pause for a minute. We're going to be silent for about 10 seconds. Because sometimes we just pray flippantly and quickly and we don't realize that we slip into a rut of saying words but not making a connection. This is Jesus we're talking to. We're not repeating words, we're speaking to Jesus. He's listening. If you can picture him sitting on his throne as he he's leaned kind of over his knee listening in for what we're about to say. No, we'll pray together. We can each individually pray it 100 percent sincerely from our heart be a direct connection with our Lord and Savior. With that picture of Jesus listening in, leaning over, would you say, please pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, please speak to my heart. Change me, Lord. Lead me into your image plans you have in my life. In Jesus' name. If I said amen, amen, amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Just a really, feel it's a really, really, really special day today. And man, I'm so excited for each and every person that is here. Man, you are, uh, you are connected with a, with a great day. It is a day that God has designed and He has ordained and believed that, uh, you know, there are things you may come in questions with that you're going to go out answers with. You come in with wonderings. You're going to go out with rejoicing and clarity. I want to uh, celebrate a couple of things as we move forward. I want to celebrate, number one, what an incredible, incredible, incredible weekend outreach, neighborhood outreach it was yesterday. Man, can we just give it up for the team that serves and gives and does. And, uh, man, I, I was yesterday as... I look, there's always something different at the end. Um, they pass out usually something to go with. And candy's easy, you know, um, because you can buy bags of it, put it in bags, and, and put it out. And, uh, and it goes. But I've watched the way, I've never even thought about it, but I watched the way their, their parting gifts were handled yesterday versus everything else they've ever received. And it brought more community and more conversation and more of a, just really a ministry moment than any of the candy that I've seen. The candy is usually put in the mouth and thrown on the ground or debated about what you like, what you don't like. Um, Todd and Christy lead up this ministry, this outreach ministry, first Sunday of every single month. I, first Saturday, too. Saturday as well. Saturday and Sunday. Follow them Saturday and Sunday. But uh, the first Saturday of every month at uh, around 10 o'clock, usually meet here by 9.30 and head out. And uh, there's a neighborhood close by that we... Uh, really just believe God has called us to just, you know what, sow every single thing we can into and, uh, and to see his works come out of it, trusting for his increase. And so as part of that, Todd and Christy had that up. And yesterday when it was time to go, they uh, brought out these big uh, like laundry and cargo containers, what have you, full of brown bags. I had no idea what was going on. And they had packed sandwiches in it and, and, and fruit and, and snacks and, and scriptures on the outside to talk about. And I mean, what I'm saying is, it wasn't something you just grabbed in a bag and threw. You had to buy several different things and spend a lot of time in order. But you know, find do you, do you not find it true the things you really care about you get the most time to? And uh, and just to see the kids and, and adults too, not just run, grab and go, but to grab and sit down in groups and hang out without any without any 
uh, invitation to do so just by natural default. It created that community. And I, I didn't recover for it all day yesterday. Thought about it till I went to bed about 11.30 or so last night. Just, wow. And I, I just, I'm just, i saying all that to say this. Um, a lot of you come here. A lot of you are involved in different things. And, uh, man, if you are not involved in the weekend, in the first weekend of the month, that Saturday outreach, you're, in, you're doing an injustice to yourself. That is the truth. It is, just, it is incredibly powerful just seeing the ministry that happens that takes place. And so many people, um, some of you don't even realize you're here directly and indirectly as a result of that. And you have no idea how God worked that in. He came in your back door because we kept going to somebody's front door. And uh, so I want to invite you. First, uh, first Saturday of every single month, 10 o'clock, 10, usually lasts about 12, sometimes a little longer, sometimes a little shorter. But uh, that's kind of the time frame. We'd love to increase that those weekends as time goes on. But uh, right now, that's where it's at. And uh, I'm telling you, who would, who would, who loves it? Let me ask you this: Who loves it when somebody, without asking for anything in return, is surprised? It's when you need it, and they show up with what you need just to bless you. How many of you enjoy that? That's exactly what happens the first Saturday of every month, and you get to be the giver. If you rejoice about the people who have given to you. It's now you get to turn the table and say, because of what I know what it's like, I get to be in the given position. And so I want to invite you, first Saturday of every single month. I can't stress it enough. But I uh, also want to invite you, you know what, if today the message just really touches your heart, today, if it's like God is speaking to you, I want to encourage you to take it a step further. On Monday nights, there's Bible study here, uh, just kind of a growing in the Word, more of that circle environment. We're in rows, it's in circles. Circles, there's community, and there's talk, there's chatter. And uh, you get to contribute and ask questions more so. And uh, so that's on, on Monday nights at 6.30 right here. And uh, I had somebody not long ago say, man, I didn't even know y'all had Wednesdays. I would have been coming if I would known. Yes, we are here on Wednesdays. And, uh, and yes, there is a lot of output here on Wednesdays. It is, you, you come, Wednesdays is high octane night I, to me. It's like people come on jet fuel. And, uh, and it is high opportunity of serving in all areas as well as receiving. It is an absolute blessing. If you've been here on Wednesday night somewhat regularly and it has been a blessing to you, would you just let us know by clapping? Awesome. Awesome. All right, so if you didn't clap, hey, you got those around you who did. Who did. Awesome. And I want to honor and just celebrate one more person. And ironically, I think she's even in the nursery. So I'm going to save it for next week because I really don't want this to go under the radar on her. But, um, Man, I can't wait. So we'll go, we'll go next week. Hug, hug your nursery helper today. And if you come on Wednesdays with children, please drop them off in the nursery, 0 to 4 by 645, and pick them up immediately following the service. Just to throw that out there. Awesome. So today we're in the book of Acts. Acts. Whoa, that's what I'm talking about. Carlos starting out back there on the media position. Way to go. Actually, he's working his groove. Lily working her groove on the camera. That's what I'm talking about. She looks so sly. She probably got a remote in her hand doing this. I need to move around. I'll make you work it a little bit. But also, let me ask you up front. Real bold, brash, right smack up front question. Who in here ever gets offended? Don't lie. Come on, this is 100% participation day. Just make it, just because you like me, please just raise your hand. You get offended. Some of you are offended right now. You're like, you keep asking me to raise my hand when I don't want to. See? Who would admit, though, that you have even become angry because of being offended by something now you look back on? It was just dumb. Let me give you an example. If you've ever had children, some of you older people, we're going to go older to younger, but if you, you're a little older and you've had children who have been through the ball system, have you ever maybe been upset at an umpire because he said your kid was out on first base, but you could clearly see from left field that he wasn't? And you gripe, and then we sow that complaint and that offense into our children, right? We pass it on, dumb umpires out there getting paid to watch our kids. Or perhaps maybe in, in younger, if you're still in, in school even, or maybe you remember some of this, perhaps you were in class and someone, this happened to me, perhaps you were in there and someone around you was talking and the teacher called you out for it. And what, and instead of just letting it go, it's not like you got suspended. You just got 
fussed at for it. It's not like you got suspended. It's not like you got a beating. It's not like you're older than back in the old days when we got whippings, you know, in schools. The teacher just told you to shut your mouth, plain and simple. And then you trash talked about the teacher for the rest of the year of how you couldn't stand that teacher and how you weren't talking, you weren't doing that right. It should have lasted all of 10 seconds, but you carried it for 10 months. If you remember what that was like. We learn offense early on, don't we? Let me ask you this, if you can go back to some of your immaturity men. Have you ever gotten a fight, whether you won or lost, because someone said, your mama? <laughs> yeah. I learned as I got older, because I was smaller than, you know, the, most other people, your mama what, you know? You got to get wise with it when you don't want to get beat up. But I remember well in about the 10th or 11th grade, I don't remember which, I just remember as Mr. Hathaway, I remember the Spanish class, because in Spanish class there were different age groups in there, there were different classes, uh, different grades in there. And I remember this, I'd had, just to make a long story short, I'd had a go-kart wreck, okay? And this was back before go-karts were trucks, when they were actually go-karts. And, and on the back of this go-kart, it had this roll cage, it, so if you rolled over, you didn't break your neck, you just wished you wouldn't have rolled over. And, and we were back here on this old railroad track where we're not supposed to be. That's why there was a gate. And, but you could pull up to the gate and you could lean your head over because, like I said, they were still go-karts then, not go-karts. And you could, roll, you could ease up and roll up under the iron gate, lay your head down. And when you got on the other side, you get your go-kart because it was still a go-kart and light enough. And you could pick it straight up, even if you were like 7th, 8th grade even, and slide it forward until it that roll cage got all the way out from that, under that gate and then just plop back down and roll on. It, per, it, it was a little more urgent whenever a policeman was behind you for being where you weren't supposed to be. But you could still do it pretty quickly. But one day I was riding, I wasn't on my go-kart. I was on, on a go-kart with my niece. And my niece was, I don't know our age differences or what have you, but she was here and I was here. And we just happened to come up, be coming up about 25 miles an hour. That's about as fast as they went. We thought we were flying. And we're about from here to the sound wall right there of the, uh, of the, the iron gate, just an iron bar going across. And by the time I say, I say, duck your head, and I hit the brake, but one problem, the brake pedal just went. The brake broke. So what happens on a go-kart when the brake does not work? It does not just stop because you lost the gas. It goes till it has the point of no more resistance. And so anyway, so I did not have time to look over and see if she had actually leaned her head down because it would have hit her in the head about here. It hit me here, so I did what any, any panicking person who would rather than not die, I do, and I stuck my hands out like this. And so as we come out, and we're approaching about 25 miles an hour, I had the strength of about a worm when I hit it, and it just immediately pinned my neck to, is where it hit between my head on the cage and neck on the bar, and, and she had her head down after all, you know, we could have both just got a headache out of the deal, but yet it got worse, and she it slammed her head on the back, so she was all right. We come home, we go to the doctor. Long story short, I got a neck brace. I, was, I felt cool. It was good for the girls in high school when you go walk around the neck brace. We're not talking about that. But I remember even with the neck brace in pain, people kind of made jokes out of me. They called me suicide. Well, except for one of them. This one guy in Spanish class one day, he was uh, like this all-star linebacker on the team. You know, when you're in high school, uh, these, some of these linebackers, they look like when they blink, like you don't see their ears because their eye muscles flex. You know, they're just so muscle bound everywhere else. And so, and this guy sitting beside me, and he said something. I don't remember what he said. And I thought, and he popped off, and he said something smart about me. I don't remember. I remember what it was, but I'm not even going to tell y'all today. But he gave me a two word name, and it was all right that he said that. But what was not all right is the entire class erupted in laughter. And so he bench presses like, I don't know, three Buicks. And, and, and I'm just trying to eat Wheaties and pray for hope. You know, in the morning it's kind of deal with my 115, his whatever pounds he is. And, and, but, and I, I tried, you know what you do, when somebody runs you down and they're like three times your size and they're all muscle, you, you try to come up with something slick back to avoid the fight but yet make them look dumb. So anyway, I tried that and it failed and everybody's like, so, and then he said something else, and everybody wrote it again. So at this point, I don't care if I'm 115, I don't care if I'm 400, I'm throwing desks. I'm like, all right, come on. Sick of you in your mouth. And I was so hoping he wouldn't stand up and eat me. Because he could have just like, oh. I'm 
know if anybody remembers Robbie Washington. But I'll throw that out there for some of my schoolers. And uh, anyway, so I was so glad he, 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 he never got up. He didn't want to get suspended and get kicked off the football team. I just wanted to look tough without him getting up. But the thing was, here's what in reality happens. Now I'm 38. I can look back to when I'm 16 or 17, and I, I, can, I can see, some, actually maybe in 15, I can see something more vividly that is the happening. You talk about dumb. Because my ego was hurt, I was offended, which is my pride. Come on, have you ever acted stupid and lived miserable because of a simple feeling, and lived miserable because of a simple feeling of being offended? Here's what I would have done that day. I kid you not. I would have forsaken my family that I did not yet have. I'd have been like this for the rest of my life. I would have forsaken the calling that God had for me over a stupid two-word statement from Him. I would have forsaken, I, I mean this, I would have forsaken, I believe, a lot of the plans that God had written for me just by responding with offense over something dumb that was said. Because if he would have ever decided to respond, the beating would have been ugly on my part. It's amazing the life that we will forfeit being defensive because we are offended, isn't it? Well, today, if you do not wish to, to be repeatedly suffering ahead of you, the same sufferings behind you, we have to admit we have to change. And usually we're pretty good at admitting change. We did this Wednesday night. We talked about worry a little bit. And we said this. I'll ask you, how many of you know worry does no good? But how many of you are really good at it? We're easy admitting we know what needs to change. But taking the active steps of change is quite different than admitting the change, isn't it? Today I hope by God's Word to give you the boldness to make the change from your plan to God's plan. Which will go from your result to God's result. And today, it's all found in Acts chapter 5. But I need to set the stage for Acts chapter 5 for you, what's coming up. Jesus is gone. He's flew. He's, he's ascended and moved on. He set the people on mission before he left. Baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, making disciples of men here in, in, in Judea, and in Jerusalem, then to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. He put them on mission before he left. And after the initial celebrations were over, at, over, life becomes real again for these guys, though. I mean, you realize sometimes there's a little fantasy period, and then there's reality. Life comes back. It's kind of like sometimes we can go to church and go, man, that was great, and then we go to the restaurant and get mad at the waiter. Sure, 3,000 people found Jesus spontaneously after church one day in Acts chapter 2. That's great. By chapter 3, we're seeing people healed that had been lame from birth. By chapter 4, the church, the people who discover Jesus are full of radical passion. They're full of joy. And they're 5,000 people strong and growing. I mean, Peter is a guy who's just walking around. And when you read Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, he is a man who's just walking around. And when he sees a crowd out of nowhere, he's just kind of like standing on the fruit box and preaching at festival. And he starts shouting stuff like this. Hey, you killed Jesus, the, our Savior. But God raised him from the dead. And they're like, we want to be saved. The crowds were responding. We were wrong. We want Jesus. We're sorry. We're repentant. What do we need to do? Peter and John, after that, they get threatened to stop the madness or else. But it was kind of like the weaker kid in the big kid bully story. Or else what? What are you going to do? But by, my, by the mid to the ending of chapter 5, which, by the way, is a few years after the resurrection, do you realize by the time Acts 7 comes along where Stephen is stoned, they've been in Jerusalem for five years. What were they told to do? Reach Jerusalem and go. But because they would not go, persecution came in that spread them and spread the gospel. The gospel would not have spread without the pain in the city they were in. So we're, we're quite a few years into this now because we're right before they're about to be spread out. And things are starting to get more real. And I'm so glad that Luke wrote Acts for us. Because contrary to possibly someone you know, possibly, contrary to maybe even a short-lived experience you may have had, Acts reveals this, that the new never does wear off. 
But it does reveal this. It reveals but that the passion does grow. I don't know if you realize this, but the day you gave your life to Jesus was not the greatest day of your life. It was the day you began to truly live. And it was the beginning of living every day with the best is yet to come. Uh, sometimes when you get up in the morning, it, it would do a, a good fresh restart when you feel the grumblies and the mumblings just to take a look in the mirror and say, oh no, I'm not forgetting. The best is yet to come. I'm not going to go, go, go down, down Sappy Sue and Negative Nancy Alley today because the best is yet to come. I'm going to find encouraging Eddie. I don't know it worked. It was the beginning of living with every day is the best yet to come. Oh, but here's the, here's the deal. The passion that you feel died never did. But you may feel the deadness. And we do feel the dead sometimes of the choices we make. Have you ever been there? You've done things you wish you wouldn't have done to only feel the shame and the regret continually trying to find your way back to where you think you need to be. But the interesting thing is this. When you fall here, God doesn't pick you up and bring you back here because you stumbled this way. He picks you up here. It's a lie of the devil to always be trying to get back when Jesus has already picked us up at a new starting point. The prodigal son didn't get taken back to the place he left off. He got taken forward from the place that he'd come back to his father. So here we go, Acts chapter 5. 5, 38, and a couple of verses here. In Acts 5, it says, So my advice, and we'll put some context to this. So my advice is leave these men alone because they're in prison. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. And the others accepted his advice, and they called in the apostles, and they had them flogged. And then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. This is going on in Acts 5. They were in prison for revealing to people the way of life through the Savior of our life, Jesus Christ. And they are arrested. And this is not the first time they're arrested in chapter 5. This is the second time they're arrested in chapter 5. Because the first time they were arrested, earlier in chapter 5, an angel comes in, lets them out at night, and they walk out. The, ju- the council gets together in the morning. They're like, let's figure out what to do with these guys we threw in jail last night. Let's go get them. And they go in there, and the gates are locked. The, the jail cell's locked, but nobody's in there. The guards come back to them. We don't know what happened. We've been here watching all night. And then about that time, somebody comes running off the street and says, hey, the guys y'all threw in prison last night, they're over there preaching in the church right now. And so they're scared of taking them by force. And chapter 5 tells, says they go back and they're scared of doing any kind of violence because they did not want a riot to come up and they would have been the ones who suffered. The priest would. So they get the feeling. They're like, come on, guys. Will you please come back? And they're like, sure, we'll face you. You couldn't host first time. You want to host second time? Here we go. And they go back to the, to the courts with them. And they're discussing. The, Peter stands up again and he says, we're only declaring that Jesus who you crucified is alive. And He is our Savior, our Messiah. At this, they all get furious. They did kill Him. Why are you going to get mad about being pointed out about something you did? You ever get caught in a lie and get mad about it? Well, you're like, no, nah, I don't lie. Well, you, have you ever lied got mad? Sometimes I have to try not to laugh. I'm raising children. And I, sometimes I have to keep myself from laughing when I sat there and watched what happened. And when I say something about it, like, uh-uh, I didn't do that. I'm sitting there thinking, just watched you. And you saw me watching you. And you're still going to try to tell me you didn't do what we both... Isn't it amazing the way we'll lie? And so they get mad. And it says they want to kill Peter and John and the apostles right there. And one guy stands up and he says, Whoa! Put them outside. Private meeting. And he counsels them and he, he says... One man, one man stood up. One man that does not even know if they're with God or not. One man who doesn't know that what they're doing is for real, but he's too scared to just not get involved in it. The courts were in session when they decided to kill, kill these men, and one man stood up. Let me tell you something. Don't ever underestimate your oneness. 
don't ever under don't ever let the devil lie and say, "Well, I, it's only me. It won't really matter if I'm not there. It won't really matter if I don't if I'm not a part. It won't really matter if I if I follow through with what God has put on my heart." Don't ever underestimate your one one man had not stood up. I don't know how the story would have written. I believe God would have intervened, but still, it'd be a much different story than we have. But what we have we have a one man hero who didn't even know the Lord yet. One man. Isn't it amazing that we can believe that when we're standing for our rights, we're one person and doggone it, we're not going to put up with anything? You talk about me, I ain't letting nobody talk about me. We're one person. We're ready to fight, we're one person. But yet when we're ready to turn around and serve the Lord and do something that lifts and encourages the whole community, oh, I'm just one person, it don't matter. Do you see the trend? Don't become blind. It's easy to become blind. One man, one man suggested let this play out. One man who didn't know which side he was on, but he was too scared to kill him just in case. Look at verse 40. And it says, The others accepted his advice, and they called in the apostles, and they had them flogged. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. They didn't let them go. The Bible's not lying, but they didn't let them go. Because, you see, they never truly had them. They had them behind bars, but they never had them under control. To control, it requires the ability to instill fear, and that's something they did not have. Have you ever experienced this paralyzed by fear? Have you, have you ever said, said, I know what I should and I'm going to, but then freeze in fear and then look backwards and say what I wish I would have? Do we have any I wish I would have in our past? And going forward, it's like, I don't know if I can, and when we look back, I, w I know I could. See, the ability to control is linked to the fear, and the fear is not something that they had on these men. They had them behind bars, but they never had them under control. But you see, we were reminded, 1 John 4, 18, that perfect love drives out fear. I love it. It says, cast, some translations say, cast out fear. What does that mean? That means fear comes in my house, and look, cast it out. I mean, fear comes in my heart, but the perfect love of Christ drives it out. It's not like it's a bar. It's not like it's shut out. It's like, come on in, and you're going out with some force. You, it, it comes in, and it's like the guy who was going to eat me in 10th grade. It's like you're going back out. It drives them out. We began today, though, talking about offense, so let's round it up. Do you realize what offense is? It's a fear that controls them. You ever think about it like that? I ain't scared. Yeah, yeah, you are. It's a fear that controls. A fear of what? This is the dumb part. A fear of feeling inferior. If you agree with any of these three things, I'm going to say, just please say, amen, yeah, right on, that stinks, that's awesome, nasty, whatever, just something. <laughs> Here's what, here, 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 here is what offense is. It's fear. It's fear that you may think bad of me. It's fear that I may not have control. Because if I could control it, you wouldn't be doing the thing that I don't like right now. Imagine if the story of Peter and John in prison being wrongly accused of anything worthy of death would have said something like this. Imagine if the Scripture would have said this. And they yelled and they kicked and they threatened because of how wrong they had been treated. Because that's what we do sometimes, right? Isn't it amazing we have a Bible that never corrects the government on how to run the church, but yet today we've been folded to the place that the, church, the government should look like the church. The government is placed by God, and it's commanded that we honor it in accordance with God's Word. It even goes so far as to say God is the one who puts man up and takes man down in government position. Check it. So I don't have any right to rant if they make a good or bad decision. I just have a decision to honor them because the office that God placed them into, and he, he placed them there always for our good, whether it was to bring us to repentance or allow us a season of rejoicing. If they would have, it would, have, it would have been, here's what would happen. If they would have kicked and screamed, here's the big deal, and here's the, the thing for you and I. It would have been their story 
and not a God story. And the reality is this. Who really cares about our story, right? How many people, how many people remember, let's just, go, let's, let's, let's just go famous on this. Who remembers MVPs of any sport from 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003? Who cares? Right? Those people do. I ran into somebody here at the ballpark not long ago, the kids at practice, and this guy is about 40 years old, and he was talking about still having all his ball trophies, and he was going on and on about it. I was just thinking, dude, really? Why? That was Dixie youth, man. You were nine and ten. The glory days are moved on, you know? Praise God. Nobody remembers our great achievements in ourselves. Nobody remembers when we get promoted to something. Nobody remembers because we got some elite position and we're, we're the president of such and such in the newspaper. Nobody really cares after that little season is over. But, but led to God's story, when people are led by God's story, the story that be told through you, people will still come up to you. I, I can tell you this for a fact, 5 and 10 and 25 years later and tell you of the impact you had on their lives and they're still having today. I was on the phone with, with somebody late one night this week and was talking about saying, it's the way people loved me in the church when I was a kid. And the way they even corrected me with compassion when I needed correction. The way they continue to reach out and continue to love me and continue to speak the best, even though I gave nothing but the worst back. It was the way they treated me there and they showed Christ to me even when I needed in some ways that I did not necessarily like. Is who made me the person I am today and has taught me about living with responsibility and honor and a pursuit to see people discover Jesus today because I want to see people discover the experience I had. I want to turn that around for every single person. And this is a grown person talking about the experience of 15 years prior. The God stories are always told later. What if, the, what if the offense that you have, and I have, and what if the way we ran about it is an opportunity that was actually brought by God to reveal His story has overpowered ours? What if the, what if the offense that comes along is, is the opportunity that God brought the offense. He allowed offense to open the door so that love could drive it out. He allowed the offense. He even invited the offense into, right into the front of us. And he re brought it for the point that we could show the world that, you know what? His story is worth laying my story down for. Have you ever considered that God may let, He may bring the storm to you? Isn't that what he did biblically? We'd love to say, oh, I got saved and everything went away. No. We get saved and everything comes. And now we have the opportunity to respond with grace. And now we have the opportunity to respond with forgiveness. Now we have the opportunity to apply not just the knowledge of the Word, but the application of the Word. And says, let there be, so far as it be with you, let there be peace with all men. I'm going to tell you, it's a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge to try to make peace with somebody who's trying to make war with you. Recently, um, this happened, happened to me, and I tried all I could to make peace, and I, the more I tried to make peace, the more I got accused. After the day went on, I was thinking, the very same thing you were accusing me of the whole time is the thing you're doing to me. But the person's blind, and so they don't see. So it... God put me in a position that, you know what? They don't need Danny's story. They need God's story. How does the person led by God lead? I'm not always that good. Don't get me wrong. I got a mouth that sometimes talks before it should. But what is the thing that we are offended by? If we would quit defending our offense, we would allow God's story to be revealed. Have you ever considered the problems that drag that you drag out in retaliation are things that God brought you to to show you that, you know what, He has made you brand new. Well, isn't it a beautiful thing? Have you ever been here? Let's just go simple. Let's put all the cookies on the ball shelf. Isn't it a beautiful thing? After giving your life to Christ, when you can see yourself respond with kindness when you know you would never have done that before? Isn't it an awesome thing? It's kind of that spiritual look in the mirror. It's like, whoa! I didn't even see that one coming. I am different from the inside out. Verse 40 said this, and they had them flogged. Why? That's what they did to Jesus before they crucified him on a cross. 
Flogged. It's not like, get out of here, boy. Flogged is not like just slapping. Flogged is whipped. Flogged is beat. Flogged is when you can get, you, if you can't get yourself up off the floor after this meeting, we will throw you out and you just figure out how to walk on later because we want you off our property in five minutes. And look at their response, verse 41. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy, worthy, worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Verse 42, and every day, come on everybody, say that, every day, every day, every day day in the temple and house to house, they continue to teach and to preach this message that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, the one they've been waiting for. I'm telling you, when the temptation is rising to become defensive about what is offensive, if you will resist the urge and continue to let God's perfect love be proclaimed through you, it will drive it away, not just in the church house, but in your house and in my house and in their house every day. The thing that is fighting you will be drove out by the perfect love of God that is working through you. Wouldn't it be awesome to go back, let's go back to that teacher experience in high school, wouldn't it be awesome to go back and let those moments of offense be a 10-second offense rather than a 10-month drag out because of our mouth? speaking the evil and the vile out of our heart. How many of you would love the thing that has always overcome you to be overcome? Whatever that is. Put, put some context to it. What do you have that just keeps, it, man, it keeps driving, it keeps coming back, it keeps haunting, it keeps condemning? What do you have? Wouldn't you love for the thing that has always overcome you to finally be overcome? Come on. Consider a life, consider that, that peace that would exist if offense was no longer a part. Can you imagine that? Just picture a week without being offended. I figured I would have got more smiles than that. Can you imagine it? A whole solid week without even being offended one time. We can't change what's given into our hands, but we can change how we hand it back. Somebody needs to tell somebody, here's the story. The life we have and the life we've been brought into and the life we've been created to, you, we have all been born at a time, at a place, male and female, certain age ranges for a very specific reason by God. Nothing just was accidents. There is no evolution theology in the theology of God. There is no, you know, sometimes we just think we're here. We're we're never just here. Never underestimate your oneness. You are one in that one place at this one time in your one identity that you have been given with the one set of experiences that you have for a very clear and a very distinct reason. It's not about us. It's not about me. Everybody say, it's not about me. High five three people say, it's not about you. It's not about you. Because that's what offense is, isn't it? Watch this. Here's what offense is at the core. Offense is only a distraction from Jesus in you and His calling for you. Offense is only. It's sin, so it's only got, it's only, it's only got, it's only got a mission. It's a distraction from Jesus in me and His calling for me. Let's not make the decisions today to disrupt the plans that God has for our tomorrow by being offended in the middle. I tell you what offense will do. And see if you've ever been here. The rejection of offense, when the rejection of offense will rise, Here's what will happen, number one, a greater appreciation of Jesus as the Messiah. Because when we begin to reject offense in a spiritual context as believers, you know what, that the heart of God begins to take over and pretty soon we begin to reflect on all the offenses that Jesus rejected on your and my behalf. We begin to realize, I'm just kicking back this little bit, but Jesus went to the cross Still saying, Father, forgive them. 
but they don't know what they do. I, get, I gain, when I reject offense, it's not just an obedience. I gain a greater appreciation for the offense that Jesus Christ rejected just to be in relationship with me. And number two, when we learn to reject offense, there becomes a greater passion for the plans that He is passionate to do through you. There becomes a greater passion for the plans that He is passionate to fulfill through us. How many of you want to walk away offensive free? Every attempt to be, I'll tell you this, every attempt to be offended, that very same thing will be less offensive next time if you don't respond to it. You work through it, and the same thing that grinds your gears today will be no big deal tomorrow. All the accusations of today, if you don't climb in the slime, tomorrow, they the same things come, next week the same things come, and it's like water off a duck's back. There's called a growth. It's kind of like being a baby, and I don't mean to be too crude like this, but you find out when you don't poop in your pants, you kind of enjoy not having it in your pants anymore. That's the way sin is. Here's what happened to the apostles, and here's what happens to us. The apostles, in the years they walked with Christ, were always wanting to fight back in their early years. So you wanted to fight back. I wanted to fight back. Big deal. It happened. But by Acts, they aren't affected by those things anymore. The things they wanted to fight for in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're, they're rejoicing in in Acts. What happened in Acts when they, as they learned to reject the past? Number one, their purpose became clearer. Their vision more defined. And their mission... Their mission. What is our mission, church? Our mission as a follower of Christ is to reach other people with His love, right? To see other people that all may know Him. Our mission is the same as it was for the, for the disciples before they were apostles. Our mission was to, you know what, shine as a witness, make disciples of men, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now here where we are in Vidalia and Natchez, Mississippi and beyond to go here and spread out. Our, our, our mission is the same mission they had. You know what happened as when, they, when they were rejecting offense? You know why they could reject offense? Because their mission, they saw the reality and their mission became more urgent. When their purpose became clear, when their vision became more defined, their vision was seeing that neighbor come to Christ. Their vision was being an example of Christ in their community every single day of the week. Their vision was... Their vision was, you know what, I'm going to go where people are to reach them where they are. That's why we go to the neighborhoods while we go out. Their vision was to love people as they are. That's why we're going to, you know what, we're going to have a conversation with a drunk just like we will the child. Because we're going to love people exactly as they are. This is the vision, the mission right here. We're going to reach where you are, and we're going to love as you are. But the reality is, the whole, the whole mission is the end. We're going to connect you with your identity in Jesus Christ. We're going to reach where? Love, love any, but connect to the one. Connect to Jesus. And the disciples, they could reject offense as their mission became more urgent. Let me ask you, do you fall in love with Jesus so much that the mission is growing in urgency? Because this is what we're striving to lead a church to do be urgent and always on mission. I want to invite you today. We just had this wide open. I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to do a step two. But step one, throwing pride aside. Today you say, you know what, Danny? I have a battle. I get offended. And I, way more than I want to, but now, I really, I don't want to be that person. If that's you, you just raise your hand. I don't want to be a person known for offense. Because that tells me you're, you're more focused on the mission and the vision of Jesus Christ for your life. Let's pray. We're admitting it now. We're taking action step one here. Action step two is when you take the application back into the home, into 
the job. And you apply the word of God to the attacks of the devil. The Lord Jesus, for every single person in here that just raised their hand, every single person that was blood on it. God, we've admitted. God, I just stand as, as pastor, as leader of the flock here. God, just asking and praying for a greater boldness to stand in the promises of your story. I pray for a quick awareness the next time that we do not need to defend our story because we are urgently and passionately about revealing your story. I pray may these people see things in your scripture. May there be a hunger for your word that grows that love for you inside of them in such a way that that perfect love drives out all that fear that comes. In Jesus' name.